Right, so um, it's not just about a random tool. Um, it's mainly about um, optimizing the memory layout of uh, C++ data structures. Um, that's a bit different than what we usually do for memory optimizations with stuff like Massive or, or heap track, where we look at how many allocations do we have, find, uh, find the hotspots there, and just allocate less. Um, this is about how the data is put into the memory that we have allocated and how we can, well, lay out it in a, in a more compact way um, to squeeze out uh, even more, uh, or, uh, to make the, the layout more, more efficient. Um, data structures here means um, stuff like structs or classes. Um, and the, the relevant bits that actually uh, require runtime memory uh, per instance is primarily uh, their member variables. So we don't care about uh, normal methods. They don't um, uh, cost per runtime instance. And we also don't care about static uh, members. Um, so it's, it's really basically just um, about the members. So for, for keeping it easy, we will just look at, at simple uh, structs here in the examples. Um, so yeah, how is the, the memory layout actually done? Um, here are a few, well, it's slightly simplified, but it's, uh, it's close enough that, that it actually covers um, about 90 or so percent of the, the use cases and, and certainly most of the things we find in, in KDE. Um, so in general, memory layout follows um, the declaration order of the member variables, so they are just put one after another uh, into the memory of the, of the structure. Um, not really surprising. Um, the next one is even more surprising. It's uh, the size a member occupies is the size of the data type. Um, who would have thought? Um, but with the third one, it, it actually gets, uh, gets interesting. Um, member variables have to be aligned based on the alignment the, their type requires. Um, for, for primitive types, like uh, the built-in types, that is usually the, the same as the size. So an integer needs four bytes of space, and it needs to be four bytes aligned in, in memory. Um, on 64-bit platforms, um, the, the biggest alignment you can find is uh, a pointer that's an eight-byte aligned. Um, and if you have complex types, the alignment of them is the maximum of any of the alignments of its members. Um, right, and then the, the only missing bit for C++ is um, if we inherit from, from another struct or, or class, um, the memory layout basically just follows each other. So first I have the base class, and then right after I have my, my derived class. If I have multiple base classes, they also just follow each other. Um, that, is, that is fairly straightforward. Um, and then you have virtual inheritance. And that is, um, that stuff is just crazy. Um, you probably remember virtual inheritance is um, used for um, moving duplicated base classes in a complicated multi-inheritance scenario. So um, if you inherit from two classes that both have the same base class, you would end up with duplicating the, um, the actual data members for those duplicated base classes. And in order to avoid that, you use virtual inheritance to merge that in kind of the classical diamond pattern. Um, most people don't use this. Um, there's only one exception, and that is solid. I don't see the guilty people here. Um, yeah, Solid makes heavy use of that, so that's why it's still um, relevant for, for KDE to look at this. Um, the problem with this then is that only at runtime you actually know the final memory layout, because the layout of the base class depends on who actually inherits from it. Um, but in, in most cases, um, we, we can ignore that part. Um, and that's just virtual inheritance, right? That has nothing to do with virtual methods. Um, virtual methods 
also have like a minor impact on, on the memory layout in the sense that in the base class that first declares a virtual method, um, there is basically an invisible member variable added for the, um, the virtual table pointer. Um, so you can imagine that as a, a void star member um, that is always the first member that you can't move and that the, the compiler just injects there. Uh, but the way that the layout is done for this is um, otherwise the same as, as for normal members. Um, so lots of the theory. Um, let's look at an, an actual example. Um, so we have a simple structure with a B member that's one byte, one byte aligned. Um, then we have an integer member, four byte in size, four byte alignment, and another Google. Um, so total um, sum of member sizes would be six bytes. Um, but how big is that actually in, in memory? Hmm? Twelve. Twelve? Um, right. Uh, because uh, due to the alignment, we can't actually put stuff next to each other. Um, so the first rule messes up the, the alignment for the integer. So we have three bytes, just nothing in there. Um, that are unused, then we have the integer and we have the bool, and then because the alignment of the whole thing needs to be the maximum alignment of, of the members, we have another three, by, uh, three bytes um, just unused. Um, and there you can already see how to, to improve this. Right? If I just reorder it to, to minimize the, the padding, um, I can cut it down by, by four bytes. So if I have a single instance of this, uh, saving four bytes in my application is probably not going to make a difference. If I have 200,000 instances of this, I'm cutting down memory consumption by 30%. I mean, that's where it gets, uh, gets interesting. Um, right, so in order to find this, um, it would be useful if we actually have tools that um, that allow us to, to introspect data structures and tell us, okay, this is where you have padding. Um, consider moving this stuff around. Um, and there's two kinds of tools that need to know the memory layout, uh, the compiler and the debugger. Um, so looking in their vicinity, we probably find, uh, find the information for us as well. Um, and indeed, uh, GCC actually has a warning switch um, that will warn you about every bit of padding you have. Um, I mean, that's a start, but it's extremely noisy. And it would also give you the warning uh, uh, for this example where we actually can't optimize anything anymore, right? Um, I mean, we, we would need to change the whole data structure, but just by reordering, uh, we can't make that um, any smaller. Uh, so getting warnings for all of the, the unavoidable cases is um, for like KDE scale, code base is not really uh, useful. Um, then there's a tool from, or a set of tools called dwarfs that uses the, uh, the debug information. So for those, you need a full debug build. Um, and it extracts the, the memory layout out of there. Um, that works fairly OK on C code, but it fails on inheritance. It fails on static members and all the, um, the C++ specific stuff. Um, and that's what actually then got me into uh, writing my own tool. Yeah? Just, uh, was there when the Acme did, if the, whole, the original thing is only for kernel and C, they never think about anything about Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, if you try it on C++ code, it, it gets completely confused by, by static members who have absolutely no impact on the memory layout. Um, so it's, it's a start, but it's, um, for our use case, um, not really usable. Um, that's why, as part of other tools in the, in the binary area, I was already working on anyway. Um, I implemented a tool called Elf Packcheck um, out of the Elf Dissector Git repository MKD um, that actually also supports um, most of the C++ uh, scenarios. Um, the only thing I can't handle yet is solid. So um, the virtual inheritance there gives arbitrary wrong results. 
it's, uh, it's doable, uh, but it's a lot of work because you basically need to recreate the complete memory layout with the four different kind of virtual tables and virtual table tables involved in constructing it, and then execute some dwarf expressions on there and find the right offsets. Um, but for all the other cases, it's uh, actually producing useful results. And a couple of months ago, Laurent got his hands on it. Um, so if you run it now on the KDE code base, uh, especially in PIM and uh, some of the frameworks, you won't find that many problems anymore. Um, but in some other areas, uh, you might not have uh, applied it yet. Um, right, and then kind of also related to the tools, um, you can verify this stuff with uh, static asserts. That is useful if you did some careful optimization of a memory structure, and then the next guy comes in and just patches a bool into it and makes it go up by 30%, right? So you can basically unit test um, certain assumptions about your data structure and get a compile error when somebody accidentally makes it larger, and then you can decide, okay, this is unavoidable, or okay, let's try to squeeze it in into something uh, more compact. Um, so yeah, what, what you can do um, to, to avoid this unnecessary padding um, is basically we order the member variables. Um, the, the general rule of thumb there is um, sort them by alignment. Sometimes you find the rule sort them by size, which is not actually correct, but in practice is close enough. Um, but there's a few surprises to keep in mind, especially when, uh, when working with C++, and that is um, looking at the alignment of the base class. And there is one common scenario that we have in, in Qt-related code um, that is uh, private classes of um, copy and write classes that inherit Q-shared data. And Q-shared data has a four-byte alignment um, while you most likely will have member variables with an eight byte alignment like a queue string or a pointer, which if you follow the, the basic rule of sort them by alignment, you have a four byte gap in, in the beginning that you are not using uh, from the base class. Even Qt had cases of that. Qt daytime still has it. Um, I wasn't allowed to fix that. Um, so if you have a few booleans at the end, you can basically move them in the beginning, fill that gap and say eight bytes in, in total. Um, when you do these kinds of optimizations, keep in mind that the memory layout is actually different on 32-bit and 64-bit, because the pointers have different sizes and different alignments. Um, and you, of course, don't want to optimize just for one case and then make the other one worse. Uh, so usually, if you optimize for 64-bit, 32-bit will be also fine. Uh, the other way around uh, isn't the case. Um, and then there's something that uh, made fixing those issues in, in KIO um, somewhat annoying. Um, there's lots of member variables that are compile time conditional. And if you don't want to totally mess up the code or duplicate it, like finding a way to reorder it so that it works in all possible combinations uh, can be a bit tricky. Uh, but then, in general, you, you get to the point where it's a trade-off between is it really worth optimizing the four bytes out of this class um, compared to the maintainability, right? Um, and then we have the, the really fun stuff. Um, one class that was showing up uh, very frequently and that is actually very high volume is QHashNode. Uh, and that slightly simplified has the um, this layout, so you have an integer first for the hash value, then you have the key and then you have the value. Key and value depend on the, uh, on the template arguments. So if you have a Q hash of int and Q string, um, the hash node is 16 byte, uh, has no padding. If you have a Q hash of um, Q string int, so just switch key and value, you have 24 bytes and 30% loss in padding, which for such a class is actually uh, unfortunate. Um, there is uh, ways of fixing that with a bit of template metaprogramming and 
based on the alignment of the various types, have two different uh, implementations where you swap the, the members and then with enable if uh, select the right one. Um, that's unfortunately not binary compatible, so we can't fix that in, in Qt5. Um, but if you have such kind of high volume template classes, um, there is actually ways to at compile time decide on, on different memory layouts. Um, so yeah, with, with that approach, we can reduce the, the waste caused by, by padding. Um, we need less memory as a nice side effect. We have better utilization of the CPU caches. So in general, that also helps with, um, with overall performance. Um, unless you have like totally tricky cases like the hash node case, um, the impact on code maintainability is actually fairly low, and right? it's just swapping around a few member variables. Um, but yeah, it's also, um, and is that really everything we can do? Um, is, there, right, is there more we can squeeze out of this? And of course there is. Um, so what we looked at so far is basically just the byte level layout that um, the, the compiler does. Um, but if you take a step back and look at um, the information we actually want to store there um, and ignore the, the actual in-memory layout for a moment, um, that shows us that there is still a whole lot we can get out of it. Um, I mean, the extreme case is a bool that stores one bit of information, but it needs eight bit of storage. I mean, you can hardly make that less, less efficient. Um, enums is often another such example, right? If you have eight different enum values, by default, that would uh, uh, occupy 32 bits. If you don't use them in a flag configuration, actually three bits would be enough. Um, even in pointers, we, we have that. Uh, if you take a Q-object pointer on a 64-bit system, that is eight byte aligned, which means the three lowest bits are always zero. So conceptually, there's only 61 bit that is actually valuable information of the pointer. In practice, it's actually less because you don't have that much addressable memory. Um, but so there's, looking at it like from a theoretical point of view, um, there's obviously more space we can fit stuff into. Um, but for that, we need to kind of look at the like sub byte or bitwise layout of, uh, of the memory. Um, there is some support for this in the language with, um, with bit fields where you can actually specify um, after the, the variable name uh, how many bits should be used for this. Um, so if you know that the integer only needs a smaller amount of bits because you don't have that large numbers, you can squeeze in some other stuff at the end. Um, if you follow Qt, there recently have been a bunch of changes to actually get rid of this. Um, as Mark found out that uh, GCC generates invalid move constructors uh, for bit fields. Um, I mean, that is of course a compiler bug, but um, so it's also worth looking at, uh, at alternatives to that. Um, in case it's, uh, it's causing problems. I mean, the, the obvious alternative is just manually do some bit shifting and masking to find out the, the bit you want. Um, that's usually hard to maintain and um, annoying to do, but it's, it's the, that's kind of the ultimate option with that you can basically arrange it uh, in whatever way you want. Um, and then we also have some higher level classes. Um, if you think about the bool example, uh, I mean, one bool is already bad, but you could have an array of bools or a queue list of bools. Um, then per entry, you waste 80% um, of your, your storage. Um, so there is a few special case classes in, in Qt, like qubit array, 
um, that actually do the, the bit trading uh, and store them in, in actual one bit entries. And standard vector of bool is also special cased um, to store this in a, in a much more compact way. Um, yeah, for enums with C++11, we have the ability to actually change the, the storage type. So if you know you only have, um, yeah, uh, 100 uh, or 255 um, different values at most, and you never want to have more, you can actually say it, uh, you know, specify that this should go into one byte. Uh, and of course, you can combine that with, with bit fields to, to make it even more compact. Um, unlike the reordering of the memory variables, this actually has uh, some CPU cost. Usually, it's just a few bit operations, so it's not, not that big of a deal compared to the performance you get with better cache utilization. Um, but then you get to the point where it's actually uh, something where it might make sense to actually measure the, the impact. And it certainly has an impact on uh, code maintainability and, um, uh, and readability. Um, and then there's another problem. Pointers and references can only address um, one byte. Or the one byte is the smallest unit you can address with a pointer. If you now start to put two different variables basically into the same byte, which you can do with bit fields, um, you can't take the address of this anymore, or you can't but you can't pass this pointer into any function that expects a bool pointer. So there you always end up uh, copying a bit, uh, a bit around. Um, the elf pack check utility can actually, for some types, I think for booleans and for enums, already measure how many bits you actually need. And it can show you the, uh, how many bits of your data structure are actually used. Um, so this helps with uh, finding ways where you can optimize this on, on this level. Um, and then there's a few more, um, I would say, dirty tricks that you shouldn't only, uh, should only use in, in case of emergency. Um, first of all, you can disable the, um, the alignment rules. That works on some platforms like x86. Um, it has a certain performance impact. And then basically the compiler doesn't care anymore about the, the alignment and everything is nicely packed um, directly together. Um, this gets you really interesting runtime behavior on ARM um, because there this actually crashes or it triggers a, a CPU error. Um, I found this in one or two places in the, the QML engine. Um, but yeah, that, that is kind of the, the last result. Um, slightly less bad, but also somewhat shady is um, actually using this pointer alignment gap. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have an eight byte aligned pointer, you have three bits that are actually unused, that are always zero. So with a bit of masking them and always resetting them to zero before you dereference the pointer, you can actually store some extra bit of information in there. Um, well, if you always reset it to zero? No, but if the pointer and it sets one, then switch to uh, the top mode. Ah, so yeah, you need to be really careful with <laughs> using this kind of stuff. Um, at least, luckily for that, um, Qt has some non-public classes um, in the QML engine, QFlag pointer and QBy pointer that do that already as a, as a template class, so you probably want to steal that rather than try to implement it yourself. Um, but this is also something I would only use if absolutely necessary and you had some like super high volume classes where you would have like eight byte extra cost for one bit that you need to store somewhere. That, that's exactly what you mean, like Slotter did. They, they stored the rule of whether the new text is or not is in the last bit of the program. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is used in a few places in, in Qt. Um, and it's, it's tempting, right? If eight byte overhead for one bit that you need to squeeze in somewhere, 
Um, but yeah, it has um, uh, interesting side effects, especially if you forget to unmask it at some, some points. Um, right, and then this all has, uh, has its downside as well. Um, the memory layout is essentially what defines the application binary interface. So as soon as you change anything in there, you are binary incompatible. Um, I mean, we are in the fortunate situation that most of the class is actually having a significant uh, of, um, amount of member variables are actually um, private classes. So those we can reorder as we see fit. And in, in applications, it's of course also fine. Um, but the QHash node example, that is something we can't actually fix uh, before moving to Q6. And that is, I mean, that is one of the, the really high volume classes where this uh, would actually make a difference. Um, CPU cost is something I already mentioned. Um, there's uh, um, also a downside to the, the improved cache utilization. utilization. So um, if you have a data structure that is um, simultaneously used for multiple threads, um, and the threads are actually running on different CPU cores, you end up with a cache reload ping pong effect that actually makes it a lot slower. So in those cases, it can actually be beneficial to move things further apart so they have different cache lines. Um, Mark has interesting benchmarks to, to show this. Um, that is, for most of the stuff we see in KDE, uh, not the case. I mean, this kind of heavy multi-threading is relatively rare. But if you work on that kind of stuff, um, I mean, that is a whole different area of, of problems you might run into, um, where the layout has actually, yeah, totally other effects than, than in a single threaded case. Um, yeah, portability, portability we already mentioned on ARM stuff is uh, far more fragile when you, when you um, misalign uh, memory. Um, the more you start with these dirty hacks, the, the harder your code gets to maintain. Um, if you reduce the, the storage size of an enum, for example, you run into problems with future extensions. Um, I'd say you need one extra flag, but there's no space left for it because you really minimize that. Um, that's all, all things to consider before really going down to this, uh, down this road. Um, so yeah, in, in conclusion, uh, it's fairly easy to avoid the, the unnecessary padding and just the low hanging fruit on memory waste that um, you might find in a few places. Um, once you get into high volume classes where you really have many, many instances of, um, it starts to get interesting to think about what you're storing in there not so much from the implementation and technical point of view, but from the like, information theory point of view. Like, what is the actual content I, I need to store here? And how many bits do I conceptually need for that? And then based on that, look for a memory layout that tries to, to minimize it. Um, and of course, none of this is a replacement for actual um, memory profiling and well, trying to avoid to allocate stuff in the first place, um, that's always going to save you a lot more. Um, so this is only like the step after you've done that, and there's really some classes where you, you need uh, a huge amount of, um, and then, yeah, look on, on how this can be um, further compressed. Yeah, that's it. So what's the most dramatic reduction in memory use you've noticed that could be achieved with this? Um, I think the, the biggest ones we had were um, 30 to 50 percent in really small, I mean the, the example I had was 30 percent, right? That actually, QHash node would be one of the cases where you actually save 30 percent. Um, I think that is, that is probably as extreme as it gets. Um, 
you can never save more than 50%. Um, well, yeah, unless it's like, well, you can probably construct an, can you? Actually, uh, yeah, I mean, if you store your booleans uh, in a 64-bit integer in a one-bit bit field, one after another, sure, but then, yeah. I mean, um, I mean, like an uh, existing program that you managed to reduce by a lot. Uh, well, right, in, on, in like actual real world code in most of the high volume classes, um, apart from hash node, I think it's usually you get a like eight byte of a multi hundred byte structure. So it's, it's not that much. Uh, so it's a few percent. I once did manually what Falker's tool gives you for free, like finding these issues in KML probably two years ago or so, and there I think it saved like, I don't know, 20, 30 max from a total of, I don't know, 500 or so. So it was a few percentage, quite significant and very simple to fix. So yeah, just mention it. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's two cases where it's worth looking at that. Either you have an application where you know what your high volume classes are, or you're working on a, a framework where you have classes that a user possibly might be using in a, in a fairly high volume. Um, for most of the classes, you have so little instances that, like, especially doing the, the more tricky optimization is not worth it from, from the effort point of view, from the maintainability point of view, and so on. But just reordering members, I, I think that, for me, it became kind of part of the habit when I just write a class, I pay attention to put it in the right order so you at least avoid the unnecessary waste, uh, the low hanging fruit, and then the rest is really for, for some high volume cases. Thanks, Walter. Yeah.